Good afternoon and welcome to this special festive episode of Bright Blue TV in which we will dis be discussing uh, the role of Christianity in modern Britain as we approach Christmas next week. It's the most wonderful time of the year when billions of Christians around the world celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. It's a busy time of year for churches as many people make their only visit of the year to share in the festivities. As the number of people who identify as Christian in the UK declines, what role can Christianity continue to play in our lives? Its influence on social foundations is, is undeniable, and non-believers can still appreciate Christian buildings, art, and charitable work. Uh, but the privileges still afforded to the Church of England are more controversial. The Church has modernised as society has changed, with women reaching the highest echelons of the Episcopal hierarchy. Uh, but he has been accused of moving too slowly on issues such as LGBT rights. And modernization has not been without its critics within the church itself. At the recent General Synod of Anglican leaders, uh, the Archbishop of York remarks that the church must not simply manage decline gracefully. And that should the church die, it should have a grand operatic death. Is the decline of the church really so terminal? Uh, what would such an operatic death entail? Or can decline be reversed? Joining me today to discuss this are uh, the Rector of St. Bartholomew the Great in the City of London, Father Marcus Walker, uh, the Chief Executive of Humanist UK, Andrew Copson, the Director of the Ozan Foundation and the Global Interfaith Commission on LGBT Lives, Jane Ozan, and the freelance journalist and spiked columnist, Ella Whelan. If you'd like to join in the discussion, you can do so by, uh, by clicking the Slido link in the description uh, or by using the code BBTV. So, Marcus, you're a parish priest in a beautiful uh, medieval church, uh, and I certainly recommend that people uh, visit it. Uh, do you believe that the Church of England is, is really dying, or is that just a, a melodramatic overreaction? Is the Church of England dying? That's difficult to say. Is the Church of England in trouble? Yes. I mean, anybody who can read statistics knows the answer to that, yes. Um, anybody who's been to parish churches up and down the country as fewer and fewer people attend? No, the answer is yes, we know we're in trouble. Is it dying? Hopefully not. I mean, Christ said that the gates of hell cannot, withstand, cannot stand against the church. He didn't necessarily say that about the Church of England. If we believe in, uh, in Christ, we must hope that the Church of England is going to keep going, the church is going to keep going. There are lots of seeds of hope at the moment in the midst of a lot of the troubles that we've been having. I mean, we've had quite a torrid two years, and the whole nation's had a torrid two years, but the Church of England certainly had quite a bad two years. Disputes over locking down, over how much we had to lock down, of whether priests should be allowed into their churches or not. Perpetual squabbling over all sorts of issues which look like we're looking internally, though also can very much look like we're refusing to look externally, haven't been great. And yet, over the last few years, the big questions have re-emerged. You know, nobody can deny that we've been talking about death and life over the last 18 months. And what that means is really there for the church to grab, I suppose, to be a part of the conversation. What does it mean to be fully alive? What does it mean to die and to die well? What happens when we die? These are questions that are alive as they haven't been really for about 70 years, probably since the war. And I've certainly noticed that these are questions that are being asked by people who are coming into the church, by people who see me in the pub, by people who, well, just all the time on Twitter, on social media. There is a real opportunity for the church to be a part of the national discussion about these big questions in the way that probably there hasn't been for a long time. You talk about the church having this opportunity, but do you think uh, the church is doing enough to capitalise on that opportunity? And maybe you could also talk briefly about some of the things that you're doing in your own parish, particularly to engage young people. Yes, I suppose. I mean, do I think we're doing enough? I, I, I fear that we spend far too much time talking to ourselves and about ourselves, and that actually a lot of the leaders of the church could be more involved in these discussions and debates. And I hope that they will be. Some of them are, you know, brilliant speakers they just need to be heard um what am i doing actually what we found is that a judicious use of social media and advertising and putting on things that are interesting and attractive for people around here actually has brought it brought in quite a lot of 
younger people. And that's been really wonderful to see. And that's really been driven really quite hard by the realities of lockdown and of the pandemic. One of the really interesting things that I think we've found is that by going heavily online, that was something which actually worked quite well for people who were older. Whereas I think the church thought that would work really well for people who are younger. Actually, people who were younger, we found, are people who are actually coming into church and saying things like, I'm living, working, sleeping, eating, all in the same room. Right, yeah. Coming into somewhere that's big with live music, with other people, with people of different ages. And that's one of the most wonderful things about church. You're actually in the city, you know, in London, how often do you actually mingle and meet and get to know and become friends with people who are 50 years older than you? And actually we're finding here at St. Barb's that there's a real development of people wanting and needing something older and deeper than they might have been experiencing yeah, that, before. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so t- what's the turn to James? So do you think that the church is doing enough to sort of modernise? We have leading female bishops, Bishop of London, for example. Um, but there's still a lot of controversy over LGBT inclusion within the church. But what's been your experience as, as a campaigner for that greater level of inclusion within the church? Do you think it's moving in, in the right direction as you see it? Well, I think to your point that uh, progress always ever moves in one direction. We are becoming more equal, we're becoming more inclusive. But to your bigger points, if I may, um, I think what uh, we've seen over the last few years or indeed over the last few decades is a resurgence in the interest of, of, of spiritual matters but not necessarily connecting that to organized religion, such as the Church of England or indeed the Catholic Church. People's trust in institutions has been eroded either because of the huge sex scandals that we've seen, but also because they can't understand why an institution that is there to preach the love of God uh, actually stops people who want to celebrate their love, i.e. Uh, lesbian and gay and bisexual people, from celebrating that love in church. It seems highly hypocritical. People can't square um, that equation. They don't understand why uh, people like myself can't become priests, for instance. So, you know, there is a level of authenticity uh, that seems to be lacking. But when they encounter real, true, charismatic faith-filled individuals in whatever denomination that that is, then yes, they want to know more and they're interested, as Marcus has said, to get involved. But I I do think, so I don't, I don't want to, uh, us to become uh, inclusive just because we think it's the right woke thing to do. I think we become inclusive because it's the gospel thing to do. It's the gospel that God has for a broken world that all uh, are acceptable, that all are lovable, that all are equal uh, in God's sight, and that we are all different and yet equally loved. That, to me, is the core message through the centuries that we're finally getting our head around, thank goodness. So, Andrew, you're one of the UK's leading secularists. Are you encouraged by the church's fears that they might be dying? Do you think you've got them on the run? You're muted, Andrew. I don't think it's my job to have the the church on the run. And I don't think that um, secularism or the growing, um, you know, popularity of more humanistic approaches to life. I don't think that that's necessarily uh, a challenge for the Church of England if it if it can make a certain adjustment. And I think the adjustment it needs to make is to accept being one denomination among many, you know, one religion among many um, in a plural society and all the sorts of things that people get from uh, their membership or participation in a church are the same sort of things by and large that people get from their membership and participation of whatever uh, of the many range of civil society groups or clubs or um, you know organizations they're part they might be part of that intergenerational mixing that feeling of you know, social solidarity that sense of community that sense of belonging to something bigger than yourself stretching into the past and into the future as well as um, stretching across uh, society today. Um, you, you, talk about, you talk about sorry. You talk about the church being just just one of one of many denominations. Yeah. Do you think that the the disestablishment of the Church of England is genuinely something that's within reach? Because it yeah. feels like that's quite a big conversation, and that would probably require a pretty significant public debate. And it doesn't really feel like that's going to be a priority anytime soon. Do you think? Do you think it's? I genuinely think that's right. Reach? 
I think that's right. Um, I think if you look back to when churches have been disestablished in the UK in the past, you know, in Wales 100 years ago, uh, in, in, in Ireland 150 years ago, um, they were disestablished not because of secularization, but because of interreligious controversy. You know, they were disestablished because there was a feeling that other churches within particular countries, Wales is a good example, weren't being treated fairly um, and that the Church of England no longer, or the Anglican Church no longer commanded, you know, um, total uh, civic membership and so was no longer um, justifiable on those grounds. But that's a different position in England. I mean, what, what's happening in England is not um, a surge in diversity of religious groups, but a surge in the non-religious. Um, and, you know, that's true now of, of most people's beliefs and identity um, uh, religious identity and increasingly cultural identity too, with the least religious society in the world together with New Zealand, more or less, um, and probably the least religious society in history as far as we know. Yeah, um, I think we'll come, we'll come okay. back so to I think the, that the, challenge the, is difficult because there's no pressure then on the church to, dis, to, to disestablish because it's seen yeah. as a sort of oddity or cultural bauble, a bit like um, some aspects of the monarchy, you know, ornamental um, in, in the life of, uh, of the nation. And that's the adjustment though that I think that needs to be made. The Church of England should, should try to see itself, I think, um, as one organisation among many um, and, and, and voluntarily give up um, its uh, dominance uh, in parts of national life, legal and political, um, which is very harmful. Yeah, OK. Let's come to Ella now. So um, like me, Ella, you have a sort of Irish Catholic background, and I'm sure that that's proper Irish, not like Joe Biden Irish from 10 million years ago. Um, and the Catholic Church remains a very conservative institution. There's not even female priests within the Catholic Church, um, let alone female bishops. I mean, what's your own relationship with your own sort of Catholic uh, background? And, and, and what do you feel, in terms of that establishment question, what do you feel about the fact that there are 20, I think, 26 bishops um, in the House of Lords, and we still have an unelected um, head of state, um, I should Full disclosure, I am a monarchist, uh, but we have an unelected head of state who is the head of, of a Protestant church. Mm. Well, yes, I was brought up um, Catholic, probably mostly to please my grandmother. Um, I, I have no real criticism of my time as a child growing up a Catholic. I think it was, I had a, there was a great local priest who used to come play football with us in our Catholic school. Uh, I learned some very good things from it. Um, I loved all the, I like all the sights and smells of Catholicism and the incense and all that. I think it's, you know, that I'm sort of being flippant here, but I think genuinely I have no problem with um, how I was brought up under it. It was only until when I became, uh, became involved in looking at the world around me and being involved in politics that I very quickly realised that a, a, a faith and belief in God wasn't going to work because I was more interested in um the present and fixing the world that we exist in now rather than uh looking to some kind of um hopeful future and I think that's part I mean Jane mentioned used the word authenticity I think one of the real problems here it, with, with the decline in Christianity whether it's Church of England or Catholicism or whatever these kind of formal um kind of presentations of religion is a bit what Andrew said is that I think too often Faith is kind of talked about like a like a youth club, you know, like or like a kind of meeting with biscuits, rather than actually it, it has to be, and and therefore it becomes degraded because of, because of course you can just as easily get what you were talking about, Marcus, the kind of solidarity that you can from going to a, you know a dance, a local dance or a um, a nightclub or going to the pub than you can if you're talking about intergenerational mixing than you can going to church. And that's not what it's about. Should there should I think that if I was to be able to sit in a room with some church leaders, I'd say find the guts to be able to talk about what you really want to talk about, which is faith and belief in God and the gospel and all of that. And you know, leave civic society to the to the rest of us. You, I think the church has too often bent towards. You know, maybe I don't really get in my knickers too much in a twist about female priests and all this kind of stuff because I think for most people, tradition is the thing that's important. And if you're talking about authenticity you know, a respect for that kind of tradition. And for people like me, who no longer want to be part of that tradition, don't believe in it, you know, part of a plural, a pluralistic and tolerant society is you say, well, that's fine, you know, and, and go, you carry on and do that. But I, I have this problem at the moment, I think, where there's, a, there's an attempt to try and bend religion to the wills of um, and the whims of modern life and modern politics, which is an incredibly fraught realm. You know, one day we believe one thing, the other day that's, that'll get you cancelled. And in that kind of, without having some kind of authority and defence of itself, I think religion can't survive because, uh, you know, as we know, contemporary politics is so incredibly fickle. And I think the thing that people still like about uh 
faith and religion is that you have a core set of principles and you stick to them. And it might tick some people off because then it's not inclusive, but actually the whole part of tradition and having some kind of set of values is that it, it might not be completely inclusive and that actually might be okay. And we will have to grow up a little bit about that. So, I mean, one of the roles that obviously the, the, the church has played historically very well and continues to play in a lot of communities is, is bringing those communities together, is mobilising communities for charitable causes. And, and one of the fears a lot of people have is, is as Christianity declines, you sort of lose that glue that holds some communities together. And so, Andrew, I want to come to you first of all and say, well, kind of what's your alternative to that? If we don't have the church acting in that role, um, uh, what, what other actor could take that role? And, and, um, and the others kind of what more can the church do to emphasise that, that, that importance? Well, I don't I, I don't really accept the premise of, 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 of your question, because, I mean, already the vast majority, I think, 75 percent of, of civil society uh, organisations in, ter- in terms of the voluntary and charitable sector um, is non-religious, is secular, you know, involves people of all different religions and beliefs working together in um, in, in, in different ways, whether it's, you know, from citizens advice and 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 and. and um, the sort of food banks that they run or the services that they run or or, or whatever it is, you know. So I think that... I suppose um, the, ch- the church is one thing, but like also the idea of what Mark was talking about, about people meeting together, uh, people <laughs> of different generations, it playing that role of, of, of a place where people come together every week to, to mix as a community in a way which isn't really kind of institutionalised in any kind of other way. Most people haven't been to church for 170 years. It's been 170 years since the majority of the population went to church. So I just don't think you're right. I don't think that, um, I mean, it's not the United States. Churches have have never played such an enormous and overwhelming role in in social cohesion as you're implying um, in the UK. Um, And, you know, one of the interesting things about England in particular is that we've got one of the most, one of the largest um, civil societies in the world in terms of range of organisations, percentage of participation, volunteering, numbers of different clubs and societies, and so on and so forth. And I think that's where people um, will get these sorts of. Um, and I think we saw that during the pandemic. You know, it's certainly true that um, especially religious organisations with premises and with, as it were, sort of formal members were able to mobilise. Um, but everybody mobilised, you know, society together mobilised. In my village, certainly, the, the church wasn't involved at all in anything that we were doing. The village hall was involved, everyone was involved, neighbours were involved and so on and so forth, local um, charities that were secular. So I think, I just think that, you know, churches might be part of that and they will be part of it because they are extremely important um, organisations for individual people's belonging and the expression of their worldview and their values. But they'll be just part of that, a, a diminishing over time, part of that fabric of, of society that exists, which is, you know, um, maintaining in spite of the decline in religious beliefs, good, strong values, lots of um, high levels of, of, of social sol- solidarity, lots of altruism. I, I, I'm one of those who thinks that the decline of Christianity over the last few decades um, has uh, can be correlated with a, a, an increase in positive uh, moral values, especially in the reforms of immoral laws from the past in the last a few decades, and I think that will continue, and I, I welcome that sort of secularisation. Okay, I want to read Marcus or Jane. Do you want to come in on that? Yeah, very much so, if I may. I, Andrew, I think that's. Just, I think you do a, a deep uh, disservice to thousands of, of 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 Christian leaders across the country who have. Uh, for me, this is about both and who have served their communities, whether or not they go to church. Sure. I think of my own community here in Oxford. Uh, one of the most deprived parts of Oxfordshire, highest deprivation levels that uh, tick every box. We run the local food bank, we reach out to the elderly, we have loneliness clubs, we have breakfast clubs, we, you know, do huge amounts. And we do it not to be, you know, cool and trendy or, or to try and get people into church. We do it because we're motivated by love for the people around us. And, you know, uh, listening to the conversation so far, it sounds as though you think we go to church to, to have a bit of a club and have a bit of a good time with people of our own age or different ages. Couldn't be further from the truth. We go to church. Sorry, I'm, 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 I am sat quietly lost because we worship God and we do that in differing ways. And to be fair, traditional church music may appeal to one certain type of person you know and and more evangelical sort of younger style music will appeal to different others but the focus is on worshiping god and it's that that fuels us to go out and engage with a a world that needs prayer and to ella's point that where she says that there are 
maybe traditional values which are exclusive. No, traditional values have always been inclusive. We've just put religion around them and trappings that have tried to narrowly um, create mankind in our own image, which I think is slightly worrying. But um, I, I think what what people want and need more than anything is a loving presence that they can feel they belong to, where they can get succor and sustenance to. And whilst religious attendance may be going down, I think faith in the Christian gospel you'll see has been really quite steady over the last few years. And well, Andrew, you shake your head, but your and my statistics will, will, will show very different. I think the spiritual resurgence, particularly amongst young people, where they've actually wanted to look at themselves at what they believe rather than be told it. And, and that's what I mean about the difference between religious organizations and, and their own faith. But the, um, the, the Bible is still the best-selling book in the world. It's still the best-selling book in England. I just want to give Marcus an opportunity to come in briefly because I, before we move on to the, the next point. So Marcus, did you want to come in briefly? Broadly to agree with, um, with what James saying. I mean, it's really interesting to note if we're going to put a figure to it. Only, I think, this year there was a study as to how much uh, Christian communities are, are doing in civic society and that and the figure that was given was 12.4 billion pounds worth of value which i think therefore puts into context ella's suggestion that was it that the church needs to leave civic society alone actually being involved really does change people's lives in the here and now and it isn't just looking to the future it's looking at the here and now but jane's entirely right the only interesting thing about religion is god Everything else really is a footnote. Everything else is an outworking of that. But the interesting thing is religion, and fundamentally, you know, the question is, you know, there's no point in keeping the church alive just because it does a, just because it does nice things, and just because it does engage in civil society. Andrew's right. Other people will probably step up to fill the place if the church does leave. We hope. You know, one can only we can keep our fingers crossed that, that people will fill that 12.4 billion pound gap in the way they filled other gaps. Now, the point is, the interesting thing about religion is God, which means the question is, how are we telling people about the love of God, about whether God is a God who's worth worshipping and a God who's credible as a being, a person who exists? And now that's something we haven't been very good at. And um, that's something we've got to get a lot better at. Otherwise, Andrew will win. Ella, I wonder what you think about the, the idea of um, sort of religious uh, fervor taking new forms within modern society as society becomes less, less Christian. I think you've written in the past about feminism almost being like a religion uh, for certain uh, women. Do you think that um, that sort of almost a, a religious character is forming around uh, some degree of like progressive politics and what some people might call wokery? Are uh, you on mute? <laughs> yeah, well... Um... I think I have like, called contemporary feminism a bit of a religion at the moment. Well, there's, or if you put it this way, there's a, a lot in contemporary politics, identity politics, whether it be related to sex and gender or race or any of these kind of hot button issues that if you say something that goes against the um, what's perceived to be the right, the, the kind of scripture of contemporary politics, you are labelled a heretic. So I think in that kind of a way, um, what we're seeing in relation to cancel culture, what we're seeing in relation to threats to free speech, very much feels a lot of the time like a 21st century um, new religion. Kind yeah, of I mean, new, is cancel uh, culture like the equivalent of being burnt at the stake um, in the 16th century? <laughs> yes, and I think that's a problem because, you know, you know, if we, you mentioned the, um, the you know, Church of England's involvement in politics in the House of Lords and um, the monarchy, and that kind of thing. As a radical Democrat, I, um, I'm not just opposed to bishops in the House of Lords, I'm opposed to every one of them who sits on one of the benches. I want that to be abolished. I also, um, I know that I'm very unpopular in saying this because everyone's got a soft spot for the Queen, but I would like to say, to see the whole uh, monarchy dissolved as well, because I think that if you have a particular position, a political position, which says, you know, talk, you know, Dame talked about love and all that kind of stuff. And, 
and inclusivity. Well, if you have a if you have a political position of inclusivity, which I would call democracy, of a kind of democratic idea that everyone should be able to have a say in the way society is run, everybody should have a stake in society, um, then you must fundamentally oppose the idea that people in that people have unfair positions of authority, whether that be bishops or aristocrats or some Tory party favourite in in the House of Lords, that they should be there. And indeed, that that feeds into I think a um, part of the problem with contemporary politics is that you have all this sort of uh, but the bad side of religion, which is you know you have you know someone telling you what to do, who who to not have sex with, who to you know what you can and can't say. Um, but there's none of the positive sides of religion because you know I, I'm you know I, uh, I'm humbled by both Jane and Marcus talking about the love of God. It's not something that I share or believe in, but I think that is the that is the thing that really resonates with people. And part of the problem is that you've equally got it feels like a lot of the time, whether it be archbishops or you know whoever gets put up on the Today program, Radio Four in the morning, to come and kind of lecture people about about politics a lot of the time. You know, lecture people about whether it's to they are or they aren't inclusive. And I think we should have a bit more of an honest discussion, which is where I part ways with Jane, which is to say that actually there, you know, in particular, religion is by its nature um, non-inclusive because it, you have a set of values that you believe in. You know, you have a uh, to kind of take a rather crass example. Um, you know, I, when I was young, I wanted to sleep around and experiment and do things that young women want to do. And that meant that it was gonna, I was going to part ways ideologically and, and in faith ways with my grandmother and my family. And I did what well, it would be very crass of me to, to want them to then change what 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 Catholicism was about and and change the way it thought about women and just to fit what I wanted to do. And instead, you take a more grown up position, which is to say, OK, you can believe in that and I can believe in this and we live different lives. And I think too often now religion is being if I was going to be really unpleasant, I would say too often now I think religious leaders are a little bit cowardly about about presenting their beliefs, presenting the fervor of their beliefs. And actually, instead, if we treated this is applies to the whole of politics, that if we treated people with a little bit more trust and respect and understand that we can have different views, whether that's related to feminism or God or anything in between and um, that and rather than watering down what we actually believe in and being and being dishonest about what we believe in, I think that could provide some glimmer of hope for uh religion, whether or not it is a kind of overblown youth club, which to defend me and Andrew, I think we were responding to Marcus talking about Absolutely Zoom events. Right. Yeah. Absolutely um, right. I mean, it strikes yeah. me that, that in, in sort of in modern Britain in particular, where I think we've created these uh, sort of alternative mythologies, which are which are kind of non-religious, particularly thinking about kind of the Second World War as sort of the ultimate battle between good and evil, as sort of replacing almost God and Satan. And um, the, the most religious festival really seems to me um, throughout the year, it's not Christmas, it's not Easter, it's like Remembrance Sunday, the time when people genuinely are very solemn and it's very sacrosanct and everyone has their two minute silence and, and that really to me as a sort of of course it still has all of sort of Christian trappings and there's prayer and, and the, the cenotaph and everything but it's kind of become more than that and that's really become kind of one of the main religious festivals um, of, of modern Britain it's replacing some of the more tradition uh, traditional Christian festivals I want you to think, think about that Marcus well, yes and no. Of course, the really interesting thing is that Remembrance Sunday has become intensely politicised recently. And every year you get the annual white poppy gate and you get the annual why aren't they wearing poppies early enough gate and you get the annual, you know, so-and-so wasn't silent during... Well, exactly. It comes into the culture wars. It's, and become, the it's become really quite intensely but... disputed, even though, you know, on the 11th, you will see me firmly um, standing silent and uh, remembrance and on Remembrance Sunday, the will of a damn good service at St. Bart's with all the proper hymns that you'd expect. But you can't deny the fact that it's intensely controversial. Um, but it's a, if I, I could just... just like, sorry. It, oh. If I just say that it is, uh, for me, it is political. It was a war. It was, the, it was the, you know, and it was a, it wasn't created just by accident. It was a decision by politicians to make that sacrifice hundreds of thousands, not new. Of yeah, but the, concept, the concept of Remembrance Sunday is about remembering those who've lost their lives. And and I think, I, I, I'm interested, Jay, I'm not sure if it's become the main religious but. Festival. It's become well, what I mean is that you, you can have, well, no, no, you can have no. the life 
for Brian. You yeah, have films like that. Which I, I know, I know, but it's become them. more meaningful because because, because it's related to real people who we know. Many of us yeah. know people who've lost their lives, brothers, sisters, fathers. You know, it's got a personal connection to each of us in the way that often Christmas and Easter perhaps doesn't because mm. it, it doesn't touch their own fate. And in that, you know, famously, the Queen's favourite service, is, as was, we heard just a few weeks ago, is remembrance, um, because she recognises the cost. And whatever you think about war, I think, whatever you, wherever your politics are, you know that people's lives have been touched and scarred and, and maimed and indeed lost because of this. And we, the sanctity of life is something, I think, that unites us all. And it's that respect of life, respect of the other, respect for difference of opinion to Ella's point, to having good disagreement, that somehow we've lost. And I'd lobby that it's the political role modeling, or rather lack of it, that sets that tone in our nation. I'm always struck when I look at Westminster and the way they behave like schoolboys of a dispatch box and then compare it to how we see things in Scotland and in other countries. I think we set a tone uh, with our leaders that is unhelpful and doesn't allow us to d agree, disagree well. And I wish we'd grow up. Yes, I suppose I looking think, for moral I inspiration mean, in Boris Johnson might be a bit difficult. Uh, but OK, I just want to go to the, to the, to the, to the final point, just because I know that we're, we're, we're pushing the time here. Um, we've talked about it. We touched on it already. But do you think that there might be some form of uh, religious sort of counter-reformation against the sort of process of secularization that we've seen in the post-war period, maybe influenced by the pandemic if people have looked for that meaning that potentially they felt like they've, they've lost. Um, Andrew, do you feel like that's that's a possibility? Well, it, it's always it's always possible, but it would be a pretty uphill struggle looking at the demographics today. Um, in spite of what Jane said, I mean, I, I'm not aware of any serious research that would, 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 would propose that either young people or anyone in general um, was, uh, you know, having a increased interest um, either in religion or spirituality, the so-called, you know, spiritual, not religious chunk has stayed at a pretty constant 25% in most academic research over the last 20 years. Um, and it doesn't show any signs of being particularly prominent um, in people under 35 either, although um, these things are very visible in media and, in, and, and, and we notice them when they're there. So I think it'd be a really uphill struggle, but it's, it's never impossible. We've seen huge um, you know, uh, surges of religiosity, like in the early 19th century, um, you know, the, the revival then, uh, which very much went against uh, the, the grain of the, of the preceding 20 years in the late 18th century in the UK, um, when we saw the, 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 the Christian revival that happened then. So it's possible. But the, the research on people's experience during the pandemic in the UK showed a very small number of people saying they prayed or they hadn't prayed before or that it had restored you know their religion and about the same number of people saying it had sent them the other way so I think that the, the pandemic probably is it, it, it has a, a net zero effect um, on people's uh, uh, religiosity I think people's um, beliefs and values will be uh, formed much more by the day-to-day -day experience of, of, of life rather than a big event like a pandemic that's that's my opinion Okay, bright blue bingo and got net zero into an episode about Christianity. Great. Uh, Marcus. <laughs> yes, I hope so. I mean, I very well, obviously, I hope so. I mean, I hope that there is some kind of a, a resurgence, a reformation in the way in which we look at religion and God. And the really important thing, as I think has come out from all of the speakers so far um, this afternoon, is that the church actually if the church wants to survive the church has got to talk a heck of a lot more about god and a heck of a lot less about itself and about boring things that people actually find either incomprehensible or um or just self you know in a very self-absorbed manner however in doing that contra ella if we're going to talk about the god whom we believe in it's going to be about a god of love and it's going to be about how do we, it's not actually about the rules and the regulations and the traditions that have been established or anything else, although some of these are wonderful and I'll stand by them to the end of my days. It's about seeing in the little baby of Bethlehem and the man dying on the cross, God incarnate. And because of that, seeing in each person, every single person we encounter from the beggar on the street to the queen, the face of God and asking ourselves, how do we engage with each person as the image and likeness of God? And from that flows 12.4 billion pounds 
worth of civic engagement. And from that flows people coming to church and singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And from that goes people thinking, I can't come to church because I've let down my grandmother because I'm doing such and such, or actually I'm not going to treat her bad. I'm not going to treat her faith badly because I value her. And all of this actually comes down to how we treat and how we value each other. And from that comes how we treat and value the God who made us. Okay, I, I want to make sure you get a final word. So very briefly, um, uh, Jane and then Ella. Thank you. I think um, just to Andrew's point, the research I was thinking of was done by uh, your neighbour, which showed that young people uh, had prayed more than their older age groups during the COVID crisis and were attending church more. And I do think there is a resurgence because I think as the world gets darker, as we see uh, more and hear of more wars and famines, of, of things that we feel are completely out of our own control, we look to hope. And we look to, to, to reassurance that there is a bigger plan. And one thing's for sure, I, my faith tells me that God is in control and whether or not people are going to church or not, that God will always be present. And I think our role as, as Christians is to be as effective a witness as we can and, and preach that love. And as Marcus says, learning and modelling what it is to respect diversity and the other is at the core I think, of the problems in the world today and the core of the challenge for the Christian faith today. And finally, Ella. Um, yes, well, I mean, I remember watching a, or actually listening to a, one of the programme over Christmas um, last year about a priest who was going around with a loudspeaker in his local area and blasting out the, um, the sermon for neighbours because he, no one was allowed to come in. And I think, you know, things like that are really wonderful. And uh, I think there's a lot of um, priests and vicars and all the rest of them should be commended for what the lengths to which they've gone throughout the pandemic to try and keep people connected. I think that's one thing that religion has done incredibly well. And um, for me, I think that we're in a very interesting, if a bit terrifying political moment at the moment where um, due to failures of our leaders, due to trends um, uh, relating to democracy across Europe and I mean over in America as well, I think lots of people are asking questions about how societies run, who runs society, who has authority. And I think the more we ask those kind of questions, um, perhaps the less likely people are to accept um, the kind of the structures and the formalities that have been that are in place, whether that's related to the way politics is run in the House of Lords, whether it's related to the authority of organised religion. And I think that, you know, we can all agree that more debate and more discussion about these things is really vital because um, if the, you know, one thing that religion is, hasn't been very good at doing over the last however many years, uh, centuries, is allowing questioning of itself and allowing itself open to, um, to be brought into question and criticised. And, you know, if more of that can happen in the modern age, perhaps not more people will go to church, but certainly I think we can form those of us who are either call ourselves secular or are just like me, you know, um, some kind of, was it that Evelyn Moore said, twitch upon a thread kind of Catholic, where, yes, I will go to church and, and when I go back to Ireland and enjoy it, can have a more tolerant and more open relationship with those who are um, religious. I think that's a good goal. That's a really fantastic um, note to spend on. There are so many questions I wrote down that we didn't get anywhere near, which is unfortunate, but we ran out of time. Um, so thank you very much, Andrew, Marcus, Ella and Jane. Really appreciate your time. Um, thank you every to everybody watching. Uh, from me and Bright Blue, I wish, wish you uh, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Goodbye. Bye.